in jai bhim so welcome to boston study group uh, ambedkar lecture series uh, for those of you who don't know the boston study group uh, it is an ambedkarite organization uh, confined to new england area and uh, we basically organize this lecture series every at least try to do one a month sometimes more um either we do it at mit harvard or brandeis university sometimes we did at umass boston also and um for those of you you know there are a lot of new faces here um ambedkar is considered a father of nation for most of the marginalized sections of india and he is the author of constitution and uh, basically fought for the rights of uh, the untouchables and the marginalized communities and uh, so we basically working um, to universalize his, some of the philosophy and value system that he preached and he has uh, advocated and uh, he was also a, a, a great scholar uh, he has written tons of books on various subjects so just to living uh, his spirit and the values uh, of ambedkar uh, these are the some of the intellectual discussions we conduct uh, uh, in boston area uh, to basically advance the social justice and um, uh, basically uh, the other aspect is like a it's a fraternity uh justice and equality so those are the some of the values we believe in so today's lecture um it's a, a subject very uh, interesting subject that um, uh centers around uh, the title of the um, the book that uh, you know author gaurav j patania is with us and he uh, published a book uh, the university as a site of resistance and identity and student politics basically um this centers around uh, the telangana movement that took place uh this phase of telangana movement uh, in 2000 i mean anywhere you take from 1995 to 2014 and um, i think most of you know the telangana uh, state was formed on june 2nd uh, 2014 after uh, 70 years of struggle uh, since the uh, formation of indian uh india as we know today the modern india uh, this struggle has been going on and um i am actually fortunate to be uh, one of the uh, activists participated uh, for a long long time starting in 2000 um and uh, the significant of significance of this movement is basically there are so many struggles and people's movement that um, indian modern india witnessed but this is the only struggle that actually was resolved and solved and was successful within the framework of indian constitution and in a parliamentary democracy it was resolved and it was a successful people movement so that is the actually a greatness of indian constitution greatness of indian democracy indian parliamentary system uh, that a a smaller state out of a large um, larger entity was able to carve out um even though the 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 majority of that state didn't accept it i mean this is the beauty of it so it was also the visionary of you know dr ambedkar who has uh, instituted this article 2 where uh, he, he anticipated these type of situations that how uh, a new states could be formed and as part of the organization uh, when when there's a larger entity and the smaller entity wants to become uh, their own state i mean according to uh, the aspirations of the people the indian parliament uh, was vested with the power to create new states and um, there was this debate at that time that um, whether the state assembly should pass a legislation supporting that but when the majority of them never want to accept you know it would be very difficult for the smaller state so this was debated a lot and dr ambedkar did not include the necessity of you know the state assembly passing the resolution which is actually uh, proved to be very 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 crucial and the uh, it is a beauty of indian democracy and constitution that telangana state was formed so there were many many um, good things and then i think uh, gaurav is going to really talk about how this whole struggle 
um, happened and how the uh, state was formed. And I was reading his book. And even though I worked uh, in the in the movement very intimately for 14 years, I did discover a lot of new things. So thanks, Gaurav. It was uh, very well done. Uh, so without further ado, I just want to inter make a quick uh, formal introduction of Gaurav. Uh, Gaurav Jepatanya is a... Um, uh, sociologist and currently teaches at social movements at the da George Washington University at Washington DC. He's also a visiting scholar at the College of Education, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and a postdoctoral research associate at the Pulius Center of Higher Education, Rossier School of Education, uh, University of Southern California. Uh, by using ethnography method, he has published several research papers. His cur uh, current project explores Dalits and black activism in the US. Obviously, he wrote, uh, authored a book, uh, The University as a Site of Resistance, Identity and Student Politics. I mean, earlier, he basically obtained his doctorate from uh, Jawaharlal Nehru U University. And his articles and reviews have appeared in journals such as South Asia Research, Economic and Political Weekly, and Cafe Dissensus. So, Without further ado, uh, Gaurav is going to present, uh, I think he's going to use some slides uh, about you know, 20, 30 minutes, and then uh, we can have a question and answer session. So without further ado, Gaurav. Thank you, Venkatji. <clears throat> Jai Bhim, everyone. Jai Bhim. Um, uh, thanks, Venkatji, and uh, thank you for coming in this late hour of the day. Uh, as uh, Venkatji mentioned, so this is, uh, so the book is about uh, three things. You say, let's title say the university as a site. So there is one we are talking about the university More space. Yeah. It's, uh, no, it's just because of this. No. Yeah. So no, it's okay. So uh, one is the university space, like what this space uh, meant for different categories, say, what does the university space meant for women? What does the university space meant for Dalits or other marginalized section? So one is that uh, focus. Another is, of course, let's say identity and student politics that, you know, uh, what is student politics at the current era in, in the current India we are living in. And in general, we will talk about trying to conceptualize what is student politics overall. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, so that's how we'll go about it. So we'll talk about the uh, little bit about what is the existing scholarship on social movements and all these case studies which we have done uh, through my research. Uh, so now, when you look at this this picture, uh, what 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 do you what what does come in your mind? Uh, you see here, there. I just kind of tried to put all these things together. And if you see the, why I'm putting it together, each picture represents different kind of identities. You know? And these are identity which are, you can say, uh, regional identity, you say Gorkha land, and there is a Jat, Jat reservation, which is caste identity. And again, uh, more of regional identity. And then uh, if the picture with the, with, with the bull, is actually we have a, a state in in southern part of India where actually this is this represents their culture and there were a lot of uh, uh, opposition by the government they wanted to ban this festival called Jelly Kuttam and but it didn't happen so that's how it shows that how cultural identities are so strong and then of course you have LGBT movements going on in India and uh, uh, fundamental Hindu fundamental movements are always there. And then you have recent Dalit Lives Matter. That's another way to look at uh, identity movements. Now, let's start with this university as a site of resistance. So how it is a site of resistance? Generally, when we talk about university, we, the first thing comes in our mind is about knowledge. And we keep hearing this word that knowledge is power. But is, it, but is that all? Is that only that university is about knowledge? or who uses that knowledge, you know, especially nowadays, how important it is to understand university as a space where knowledge is so uh, marketized, it is ranked, you know, there are all these kind of how market is deciding what knowledge is to be distributed and all these things. And 
Now, there is another side, which is you look at the university as a side from the student's perspective, where you look, uh, like, especially in last 10 years, how student movement uh, re-emerged uh, in university campuses. And uh, I will just go through that, how, why it emerged, and what were the reasons, what were the causes. Now, to, before I go to uh, the Telangana issue, I just want to set up the context that what is happening in university campuses these days. And now, um, looking at just, there are thousands of uh, news items, but I'm just focusing on some of these just to show you that this is the change, or this is what is happening in university campuses, that there are, there are these uh, internal struggles going on where you have internal discriminations within campuses. And as a result, you, there is another way to look at university space than when we talk about ident identities. Now, uh, for those who don't know what is uh, uh, schedule, this SCST and OBC, which is basically these, these people from the lower caste who get affirmative action policies, who, who constitute a large number of population, but their, their uh, uh, presence in the university campuses are very, very minimal. So that is what one of the struggle which is going on that why we are not represented <clears throat> in the universities. And <clears throat> this is another side to look at a university that how lots of lots of uh, uh, discrimination leads to different kind of pathology, different kind of uh, stress, and many people uh, in India are committing suicide. And this is I, why I'm showing that I think you must, you uh, this is a this is a very latest data, not our data, but you see here uh, this is very shocking data that 26,500 students have died or committed suicide, which is not a small number. And where are, who are these students and where do they come from and what are the issues? No, there is no study at all on these issues. Reason why? Because Indian government or India in general has not recognized mental health as an issue. Uh, and uh, a lot of study, uh, recently I was part of uh, a, a group that studies caste and mental health. So that's why these some of these data we collected. When, and this is the data presented by the government minister in the parliament. <clears throat> and unfortunately, Maharashtra, which is the state of uh, Baba Sahib, Bambedkar, had uh, represented the largest number of uh, student suicide in, in, in India. And this number is very shocking. And I think, and these are the government statistics. If we, uh, any independent agency start working on it, then you can see a very uh, kind of different picture. So now let's talk about why now I'm talking about my research, looking at university space from a student uh, resistance angle. So this is uh, the book which I'm talking about is basically the ethnography of a, of a student activism. Uh, why I took this because uh, uh, Telangana movement. So this was a movement which I studied was this movement for a separate statehood. And this movement is a 60 year long movement. So I was interested in studying a, a ongoing movement. So what happened in general uh, sociology so far a, until uh, uh, recent, that people, sociologists tend to study a movement when it got over, when it gets over, when it's done. So then uh, there are, so then I took this challenge. I said, I will study the ongoing live movement. And although I took that challenge, but what happened when I finished my field work, came back and or I was analyzing my data. In the meantime, the move, the, the, the movement got over because the state was formed after 60 years of struggle. So then I had to go back and do the second round of interview, the post Telangana, like post state formation. So that makes the study even more interesting. <clears throat> so uh, I was, so it, it, this is the first sociological account of Telangana student movement. And the reason is that why I'm, I'm saying first, because Nobody has looked at Telangana movement from students' perspective. And actually, it was started by the student, led by the student, and basically carried forward by the student. And that angle was missing. So that's why I focus. And this is also the first ethnographic account of a of Osmania University campus, which is one of the oldest universities in India, established by a Muslim ruler. And uh, uh, one of the top universities until late uh, 1970s. But then after that, there was a downfall academically. 
and now it is one of the the normal state university where uh, hardly there is any academics going on so and there are many reasons for that we are not going there uh, so this field work was conducted in 2013 14 and then uh, thesis was submitted in 16 17 so i interviewed five generation of campus activists were from 1960s onwards so 69 was the first uh, uh, agitation which led to a huge movement and now uh, what, is, what is interesting is that that's the same time almost 60s when there were movement going on in the u.s uh, free speech movement columbia uh, student protest and berkeley free speech movement so this was the generation when all these feminist movement lgbt movement were taking shape and somehow there must be some linkages between India and or rest of the world and the US. <clears throat> I used this framework called New Social Movement. This was the framework which was actually emerged after 1960s uh, US movements because when, when especially when 1960s feminist and LGBT movement emerged, that was the time when people were looking for a for a new framework to understand these movements because before that until until 1960s if you see there was people there was only framework we had to look at the social movement was the marxist framework that there are these two classes the class framework of marx but then in 1960s scholars in the us developed this new framework which we will talk about a little bit that and that that gave rise to to all it opened up a new scholarship to study uh, uh, student politics. Now, these two scholars from the US, they went to India and started studying the uh, student politics in India. This is, so they are the one who basically the, the initial, uh, uh, you can say the, the pioneer uh, who started this student politics, uh, study of politics. And these four thinkers, C. Wright Mills, Aaron Torren, J. Habermas, and Malusi, these and and later on Castle joined. Uh, these five thinkers were the one who developed this framework called New Social Movement to understand these new identity emergence. So we will, because we are running short of time, I'll I'll just run quickly. And uh, these are okay, okay. So uh, so and but but keep asking questions or keep it ready. So this is uh, these are the new way to look at uh, uh, social movement, the, the current social movement. Like for example, what is contentious politics within within a social movement? And people started looking at the power issues of movement. These are kind of very recent work in say post nineties. Uh, <clears throat> so I uh, draw upon largely on these studies, which I am showing you right now, that. Uh, how identity, culture, and the state, like these kind of framework which new scholars have developed in post-90s especially, and where culture and political context are kind of mixed in certain way and brought new kind of analysis to the uh, student move, uh, to social movement. And these are, uh, why I'm showing you all these, that you see in all these books, what is important is that how there is a, there is a shift from ideology to identity and that's the shift in student politics and also in the scholarship that from 60s to to 90s and this is the the recent most recent work in post 2000 that in a way go deeper in the issues of of, uh, of diversity uniformity like which these issues were never studied before so i uh, was so now why I keep saying what new social movement, but what is new in this new social movement? Or is it just the, I mean, what is the difference between social movement and new social movement? So, well, I would say that what is new is that the way these new, new the way uh, new, so new uh, formations are happening. Like for example, now uh, the best example you can say, Me Too movement, where you don't need a, a physical presence of uh, or see online moves best example is arab spring you know that uh, how without any you know face-to-face uh, -face communication we led a worldwide movement and it had a larger impact as well so the way people organize themselves the way networking happens or so again going back that the, this is the shift from ideology to identity these movements does not have any ideologies 
part of spring doesn't have a ideo any ideology so many other like or, or many other uh, recent movement you see so this is the shift <clears throat> and plus the focus of this movement is not class based see this is a kind of different new class emerges and you we cannot even predict what kind of class will come and form a movement like sometime even a, a new because with the growth of capitalism and new capitalism we have these new classes that are emerging which uh, is hard to explain in the old marketing context you know uh, especially in identity based movement and what kind of identities are emerging so these are the new question like for example even within say caste based movement this is also i study from the new social movement perspective because the way now dalit to dalit politics is being organized this does not follow any uh, old uh, framework of uh, marxian or is there is the, there is no power structure in work works in that way which marx used to explain so this these are the new formation where we have a global connection but issues are still local so from local to global and these are i'm quickly running through these are some of the pioneer work in indian context what i showed you so far is the us context these are the indian context where some people like this is professor ghansham shah who uh, also uh, commented on my book he is one of the major scholar on social movement who uh, went on talking about caste and uh, religious identities and the new formation within castes <clears throat> and then we have this us scholar who worked on india um, called gail omet we draw largely upon from his right from her writing and she also talked about this you can say re reinventing revolution where say new social movement and socialist tradition in india so she she basically present pre presented this debate uh, of uh, of marx and uh, first time talking about marx and fully embed right movement that is the contribution of gail omet which actually uh, i think most of the caste scholar are taking it forward and these are the most recent work which are uh, helped us understanding the current state of social movement where one is by jangam chinaiya uh, some and these are uh, these are um, uh, dalit scholars and uh, first one is uh, is uh, a, an american scholar who recently who was there also in our new york conference but who worked on a a small employees uh, formation uh, uh, in india and so i think these are very important and now now with all this i'm getting back to my study on regional identity now this guy professor myron wiener he wrote a book in 1978 talking about three major uh, movements of the time one first was shiv sena in mumbai and then uh, telangana movement and uh, also he studied the uh, the assam uh, revolt and the formation of new assam so and he brought out this uh, idea of sun, sons of the soil and which was again you know used to explain that how regional identity and or this whole regional affiliation how uh, this actually takes shape in in indian context and afterward there are a lot of these books new book came up on north east part of india and they got their separate statehood and uh, you can say some movements are still going on we have not heard anything about jharkhand but jharkhand has been a very old movement but they somehow movement is not taking shape but you know new, now there is a new jharkhand move, uh, demand for the greater jharkhand is coming up so you know there is no there is hardly any study on these but these are kind of initial uh, people who talked about it and then this is a, a our professor t k oman who linked actually this whole identity issue with the citizenship issue the regional issues with issues of citizenship and i think he is another pioneer scholar which uh, he inspired a generation of young scholars he is uh, uh, he was also our professor at jnu now uh, why this movement is important we finally uh, understand why this import movement has uh, uh, is talked about a lot there is so much literature has written on it so this is existing literature i'm just quickly running through that we why when i started writing why i was interested because the existing literature these are most of these are journalistic account 
and it is unfortunate that actually most of the people who were part of the movement or oh, you know all my friends who were activists they did not take this forward we actually suggested them to to write on it but somehow only journalists were writing the this was a this was a scholarly scholarly account but this is a historian written by an historian you know and then this guy gautam pil this this book was i reviewed his work and he is the first book right after the reformation but it is not a study of of uh, overall uh, telangana movement it's the study of the the state of telangana here like you know the agriculture and all other issues which he wrote so it's a compilation of a book so on that uh, giving that uh, i thought let's publish it in a, in a, in a book form and uh, it simultaneously right after me Uh, no when i was writing so some of these issues were coming up and then i'll show you that why it is important that how uh, these are the issues which we were missing so now in the map you can see so this is the southern part of india uh, this and telangana is there and so this is actually this, this three thing you see this is this was a joint state called andhra pradesh and this part red telangana wanted to be separated from from this area so uh, this was the movement where they led uh, a huge struggle and this is a famous college of uh, the university which is known as the the hub of activists you know so it's called arts college one of the the finest building and very magnificent structure and uh, established in 1919 uh, by the muslim ruler i was there for a year entering in this building every day and meeting people so this is an arts art and social sciences so uh, this is also kind of one of the observations that uh, in 1969 when movement was started the student activists were were coming from all the discipline either is medical engineering and all but when it was when i was studying in 2000 onwards this is remained the, the movement remained only limited to the social science people so arts college where actually so that is as it is said that uh, uh, you know social science has no future in in india because there is hardly in jobs so people what will they do then they'll participate in a movement so these are the the observations of the people that that's how people actually enter in the the campuses uh, so this during uh, uh, my field work in th th 12 13 almost every month there was this protest going on and thousands of people will gather and these were kind of huge rallies and such an overwhelming uh, uh, response of every rally and then you feel like you know next day the state will be formed but again there was a whole this negotiation was going on now when we study the history of telangana movement these are the word you will come across i think venkat ji because he's from there these are the words actually that's how the indian state kept cheating the people of telangana by using these words safeguards like say safeguard is the word which actually they said uh, so now um, let me just uh, uh, the the word i used is called uh, internal colonization the word which was used by the first state reorganization commission in 1953 they said when when this region telangana region if because this was a merger uh, because earlier india was divided in 500 kingdoms so all these different kingdoms were merged and became an indian state so this telangana state had a very different history of islam islamic ruler so they did not want to merge they have a different culture but it was merged with a police action forcefully it was merged now the first state reorganization commission said that if you merge this region with andhra it will be in future it will be uh, it will serve as an internal colony of andhra and that's what exactly happened but the then government jawarlal nehru and you know nehru government congress they ignored these uh, suggestions and they formed the state and uh, kind of there were many commissions and now you see the other word commissions if you study this is an interesting history of this uh, movement you will not find in any other uh, uh, part of india that for one state there will be dozens of commissions and every 2 3 year there were another commission then if they were tired of commission they will they form a committee then they will bring some government order or a statement but they never gave uh, telangana to their people 
So the first generation in 1969, uh, which you know very well, all that generation I met many of those people interviewed, and they were the one who fought for their state in for almost a year or long agitation and without any without any strategy without any proper planning they they lost so many of their friends and imagine in those times of india when there was no proper law was followed you know according to police law you cannot shoot on the upper part of the body but he but directly police you know kind of it was a direct firing almost thousand students were killed but official data says Three, yeah, yeah. three sixty-seven, some. But when I interviewed these people, they said we, after a while, after a year, we lost our energy. Every day, just going with protesting. He said when uh, I we went to claim the body for, of our friends, so bodies were piled on each other, piled up on each other, and like you know the until the roof ceiling, and then they'll put another board and then another line. So he said that was the state of affair, but government who didn't accept that there were thousands. He said, according to them, there were thousands of, and this this never happened in any other movements in India. So people actually, again, uh, as we were talking that, you know, this is a, one of the, the movement which achieved its um, uh, a state, which uh, achieved its statehood through democratic process. And that's what exactly these people did. They said, how long will keep fighting? Uh, with police so let's form a party so they formed a student party called telangana praja samiti and <clears throat> this is another interesting fact they formed a party fought the lok sabha seats they won student party won uh, 11 seats out of 14 huh. and now they thought now telangana is ours so we followed the democratic way and uh, everything was set they said okay Overnight, the leader of the, the movement, which is a politician, he sold the party to the Congress, to Indira Gandhi. So now, next day when people heard that their whole dream shattered, they lost their lives, their, their friends' lives, those who lost their career. So all that pain, that agony, that empathy, where did it go? That whole, where will it go? That's the reason that they all turned into Maoists. Next slides. So that one generation, they started their struggle. The, sh the struggle shifted from campus to the forest, the jungles. And that went on for generations. So I think many people I met, those who uh, struggled for 20 years as a Maoist, as an exilite, then came back to normal life after, because they realized that this is uh, after working 15, 20 years with exilites and um, they said, oh, we are fighting here imperialism, capitalism. Where is our Telangana? Huh? Then when they finally realized, then they came back. And uh, one thing I want to mention that some of the people who came back, and, and, and in fact, most of them were the lower caste, the Dalit people. And I said, why did you come back actually from Telangana? He said, first of all, there was no Telangana issue. Telangana issue has never been the priority of next lighter most movement. He said, first time we heard the slogan from somebody from North India came into Andhra Pradesh, gave a slogan called the bullet is power, bullet is more, ballot is more powerful than bullet, Kanshiram. Huh? And he said, we were so inspired with that slogan and many of us joined BSP in, 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 in Andhra Pradesh and led the struggle from a different. So again, after this 20, 30 years of struggle, activists and intellectuals they both realized that this way you cannot fight state you you cannot get your state let's follow the democratic way again and then in 2000 they again came back together and formed this telangana rashtra samiti and they were again looking for someone and the same find like mari chenna reddy the the guy who cheated them in 1969 in the same character they found this guy ksr you know, because then you need some politician to represent them. So they couldn't find, they knew shrewd, they, 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 they were looking for a shrewd politician who can bargain with them. And, and KCR promised them that I will bring Telangana in a democratic way through negotiation. So stop this struggle. So then struggle happened again in a very democratic way. And that is where Osmania's role came very important. Uh, 
So this is in in this after this long struggle when intellectuals actually come up with in 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 these thirty years, especially until two thousand, when they realize this because imagine this, this the the state was remained so backward because it was made backward by the by the Andhra people who actually settled in the uh, uh, in 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 Hyderabad. They never gave education to Telangana people, and this represents that. That's how because uh, this is a myth, uh, Venkatji, that people say that Telangana is economically backward, agriculturally backward. Actually, the data shows that Telangana has all the minerals, all the water resources, all the agricultural resources. But what they have done, they actually made dams in Telangana and brought all the water to Andhra. So that represent that that's how Telangana and this is Andhra. Uh, so this is the the picture that people understood when they got education, and this is where the role of un uh, university intellectuals comes in. So when I talk about university space, it is not just student; it's the 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 the, the university professor, the faculty, the intellectuals, and uh, I we must give credit to the 69 generation when there was a there was a professor. I'm just uh, vice chancellor in 1969. He organized this conference on the issue of Telangana and and telling the intellectual that what you do, what 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 should be our strategies when actually state does not cooperate. And he organized this huge conference in six seventies and said, "You collect the data, and we will convince the government." Of course, but government you could never convince. And now in two thousand post two thousand onwards, this is the state that when people got educated, it was such a uh, so uh, in one of the uh, so I also claim after studying this movement that the amount of literature this movement has produced, none of the movement in the world has ever produced. I met people. Who you know, young guys of 30s, 40s have written 80 books on Telangana issue. One guy took an oath after seeing all these discrimination and cheating and you know uh, betrayal. Then he said, "I will write a book a month until Telangana is formed." And he wrote 120 books. So this is the kind of you know uh, attachment, emotional attachment people had. And then in 2000 onwards, when people when so. Because of post-90 uh, globalization era, now Telangana, Hyderabad became a cyber hub. It became all these whole new multinational companies settled up. But still, there was no job for Telangana people. That was a, why? Because all the companies were owned by the Andhra people, the, the other state people, and they never. And this is the see. That's that's the struggle they had to do. That you both the states speak the same language, but accent is different. So that's what one of the form of discrimination. They never could get ahead, and uh, uh, this is another kind of. It shows that the the, the frustration they had. They because they were never given any share in the business, never given any share in the politics or or or, or economy or industry. So they had to depend on. So you, if when I was I, so I saw that change when it was happening that. All over Hyderabad, there were Andhra tiffins with like small dabas and hotels, and they started changing when uh, the movement was like you know came, uh, it's picked up its momentum in uh, 13, 14. Then many of them shut down or closed down. So, and now some of the things which uh, you see that how over a period of time that how this. Anger developed against Andhra. So I was participating in many of these marches, and I seen that how people had, you know, just list, just seeing this word Andhra, they will delete. And see, Andhra was, you know, Telangana was formed in 2014, but I have seen in 2010, 12, 13, people had already changed the the license plate of their of their vehicles. So that was also the form of resistance. They already started writing TN. You know, Telangana, many of the activists. So this was the, but the thing is, this movement was never highlighted. People sitting in Delhi had no idea why. Again, goes back to the, because the entire media, I'll show you the slide, that entire media was owned by the Andhra people. You know, again. So in this movement, from the social movement perspective, there is this interesting concept they have developed called Joint Action Committee. Now it it sounds very simple, joint action committee, you know, but actually this became a a a, a it's kind of 
many people are now even studying this concept that what was this concept it was started by the students they said let's come together because students were also divided and then eventually it went down to every section of society and it can you can list actually all the joint committee from that end to this end there were there are end number of from you know politics to employees to pawn sellers to rickshaw wala joint action committee you know fruit wala joint action committee vapar every single section shoe repair wala so every section made their own joint action committee and that shows the strength that how every section every social category somehow was wanted to participate in the movement and <clears throat> and uh, um, then it comes the caste question that i think this is another uh, uh, when we talk about joint action committee every caste also formed their joint action committee like you take any caste from upper to lower they were all part of different formed their own joint action committee so you imagine how many leadership the movement has produced at every village and every taluka you know so even within village there were subcategories so i think every caste represented themselves <clears throat> and this is just like you know i present just for this purpose but there are like thousands you know so i wanted to quote here when i was explaining i want to quote franz fanon and he because this is the struggle between settlers and natives and he say settlers make history and he's conscious of making it and because he constantly refers to the history of the mother country he clearly indicates that he himself is the extension of that mother country and that's what uh, uh, i have all seen and other interesting fact is that because my supervisor or the the the, the, the guide he was also from andhra region and that i also had to to face that anger when finally i wrote thesis and gave you know the draft and this is what and you know what uh, uh, just for that is very interesting that i quoted fanon there and he said oh you should not quote fanon because he is not a social scientist so imagine you can go to any extent to prove uh, you know uh, that you're right but see such an interesting work fanon has done to explain this uh, settler native debate <clears throat> and nt ramara when he came he tried to bring he he tried to even he, he said don't use the word telangana we are andhra and uh, let's bring telugu unity and that's where people started uh, opposing this uh, this telugu thalli so this is the in a way state symbol of uh, telangana and this was also opposed during the movement they said uh, Uh, and this 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 uh, this written in telugu is basically sung in the the official departments also uh, during many rituals and so telugu thalli we reject this. no no that's what i'm saying see here yeah, yeah. so this then uh, they said we our our mother does not represent your you know you, our mother this is our mother and that's how they they so they changed many symbols they said our mother should look like the mother who comes from a struggle he said this is our mother and then there were other so this is the kind of statue they uh, this is her statue which they established in many uh, districts uh, so chakli ilam was uh, during the telangana armed peasants exactly yeah she is a washerwoman lady yeah so this is mm. we're talking so, about first exactly uh, communist movement mm. in india yeah where, So this and is kind of how there. how how like kind of so subaltern uh, you know characters were now be taking over. She the... voted and killed the big landlord. Exactly. Oh, yeah. Lady, yeah. the watcher woman lady, in 1940. Mm-hmm. That triggered the whole mm-hmm. Telangana peasant struggle, armed struggle. Mm-hmm. And here in this slide, you can see that when why movement were not represented. Like mm-hmm. even people sitting in Delhi had no idea that Telangana was even formed. or what was this movement but here you should see uh, there is no ownership even uh, actually one uh, around 2010 when kcr uh, this year he started his channel and that helped he gave he gave employment to many telangana people as a journalist or working for their newspaper and it was a uh, it yeah yeah exactly and <clears throat> so what this movement was doing in last 10 15 year by by rejecting those symbols and bringing you new know, is basically de andraizing and andraization of telangana and this is what i call the cultural renaissance of telangana and this is the way actually the new social movements are uh, you know 
uh, are fought and this is the nature of new social movement and now you can see uh, an, the, the way they started boycotting they stopped watching their movies they many times it happened they burned the cinema halls they said we won't don't want your so the, so backlash happened in in in, in several different level <clears throat> uh, and hundreds of different slogans uh, they they devised just to present that how telangana is more important than so these guys are all these i was with them uh, these guys who were doing this struggle and uh, uh, yeah now this is another interesting strategy of the movement they started this padyatra and uh, you see this statement is such a power of the guy imagine the kind of status students received from the common masses and politicians were afraid for a while that you know these students will take over when they got so much respect so this is kind of uh, that's where kcr had, had to change his strategy and enter again back in the politics for uh, entering the student politics uh, launching his own uh, student uh, party and doing something which student want and this is finally you know uh, people started writing even intellectuals started writing this kind of statement that you have to belong to telangana first because imagine i think this is the only movement in the world where someone i mean 650 around 650 students committed suicide for their statehood and when uh, people talk about it there are all these controversies and all but the fact is that there because what how would people do when there is no job people if you read the suicide notes they have left they said uh, i am dying because at least you know uh, 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 my death might form telangana or my death might give employment to my family members so these are such a pathetic letter that how this was happening and this is that's why i think intellectuals were also understanding that there is no other way now is the high time and when all these were uh, when i'm saying cultural renaissance so this was basically the the caste culture which is now coming up the lower caste were taking shape now uh, acha baba sahab has a very close association with the, with osmania because they also gave he received an honorary degree and baba sahab uh, dr ambedkar became a a kind of the revolutionary figure uh, he he was he was interpreted in a, in in a very very different way than we see in in maharashtra and north india so here because of the communist movement ambedkar uh, was not highlighted until uh, late 90s but in post 2000 era it was all over ambedkar was all over and other characters become subsided <clears throat> so while i was just some of the picture from the the so this was a kind of uh, the way they were organizing these protests was interesting that there was a competition who would actually organize first who would do the protests first because and so every student leader had a had a television in their in their hostel room and they were constantly there were always somebody in the because they will listen to the news what is what is happening in delhi anything is about telangana let's do the the protest now whoever will do the come in the media so this was a kind of this is the strategy that how people do and uh, of course uh, uh, mainstream parties like nhui and bjp they get always in the limelight so people from the lower uh, uh, those who are not popular unions they have to struggle hard in different ways so this is saying that how feg was you know already it was kind of ready made you know you have to just put a tag on whose feg it is <clears throat> and another interesting aspect venkatji of this movement is that this is the only movement where generations from 1969 guided the the present generation they 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 formed a the group called 1969 movements founder forum and they started having meeting they said the mistakes we have done in 69 we don't want this generation to do we lost so many people we don't want them to lose so they started collaborating with them inviting them and telling them that's how you do do this media strategy talk to the go do this kind of uh, uh, stunt and all these kind of thing they were guiding and this was a close connection and uh, their they, their life itself was an inspiration for many activists <clears throat> and at the same time uh, these parallel 
uh, you cannot disassociate that how uh, um, um, curse ideas on the small set formation that was highlighted so well. I think the, I have attended uh, uh, dozens of seminars just on the idea of Ambedkar on small set. So people were reading actually in uh, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> talk about mm. like. And at the same time, when Kancha's uh, thing was saying, this is such a powerful statement. He said, why should I worship the God who doesn't speak my language? So the language issue. He said, stop. He said, don't get into this accent that Telugu and that speak in English. English is the only the emancipatory language. So this is another at the same time movement was going on. Is And he, I think, I think Kancha has inspired a law, a whole generation of activists with his activism. And then Beef Festival, that added to another uh, kind of... Uh, you know, spice in the fire uh, uh, by doing this. And uh, at the same time, student, uh, many Osmania students, and these are all Osmania students, uh, Telangana students, basically. So FLU, which is an English foreign language university close to Osmania, many of them were shifted there. So I was staying in both the campuses. So what, interestingly, when, when there was a fully raid in Osmania campus, so or FLU was giving the refuge. So th that's how these two in universities are interconnected. So you cannot actually miss FLU. So I was always in FLU looking at interview. So and that's the time this movement was going on that. Uh, this is, I would say, again, cultural resistance, boycotting everything of Hindu hegemony. And these uh, new groups were emerging, Bhim Drum, which is basically uh, kind of musical groups in the name of by you know again the culture was becoming the core uh, arena of struggle and uh, this is another popular there is a I wrote a whole uh, uh, section on called uh, Dappu which is the the drum that how Dappu was used as a symbol of cultural resistance many people started writing their name uh, their surname as Dappu you know so this is the way actually they they kind of uh, resist. And uh, this is just one news below, but there are meetings almost in every part of India on Telangana, wherever Telangana people were living, they were organizing. And of course, I forgot to mention that, uh, you know, this was the, the only movement which got a global uh, network. And Venkarji was one of the, the pioneer who highlighted here this. And, yes. you know, in India, except Mumbai, nowhere else. No, no, it was in Delhi. It Where was Delhi in Delhi. Was very oh, no, only no. universities. No, I Delhi I university. participated. Huh? In, in university. Partic participated. University yeah. Jain University. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. is different. Hmm. But general population, a lot of Telangana yeah, people I, exactly. went to Mumbai for mm. labor. Yeah. So that's the only place you could find. Right. But of course. Yeah. Uh, the but global, wherever yeah, students US, were, where were Canada students? and exactly. Australia, England. Yeah. We, we did mm. a lot, but in yeah. India, very even important. in small countries, wherever Telangana people live, they form right, this. Right. So it's called NRI, like non resident Indian groups, all over. I mean, you can check online and how they formed. And uh, so let's summarize it, then we can have question answer. So, as I already mentioned, that this is what I found that this needs to be explored because most of the literature is written in Telugu language and which is unexplored. If someone does this work deeper, there is a kind of, he can do lifetime work on how much they have produced. You know? And uh, this movement has highest number of suicide and death in the making of, of a statehood. And uh, again, more than the economic factor, it is the cultural factor that worked in the background of the demand of Telangana. So what I try to show you a little bit about that how this is either food, language, uh, uh, even the dress, accent, all these things become a festival, you know, rituals, everything was challenged, which were actually even I mean I wrote a whole section on food that how food was also we said oh, we don't want Andhra food we have our own so every single thing was and people were explaining I said I was asking activists I said what is wrong with Andhra food he said and then he was explaining I mentioned in the book he said see this uh, their rice now does not have a, a proper nutrition it is only vitamin C it is only this and so they have actually this whole language to explain you know? so <clears throat> and then. Uh, so neglect of sub-regional aspirations, cultural oppression, and internal colonialism led to deeper tension between migrants and sons of the soils. So this is what I think became the base of, and and I would say this is this keeps happening. Uh, in in future, it it will 
it will come to other states also because this is becoming a major tension the reason is that government is not able to provide uh, employment to youth where will i think the similar problem in future north india will also face because most of the migrants from bihar and up are going to these states haryana punjab and now youth have no employment there either they are going for uh, drugs or alcohol and all and finally there is no solution you know how long actually uh, people will depend just merely on agriculture they have to have develop industry and look government needs to look something uh, for for future employment so uh, and yeah we already mentioned that you know these are the symbol of contentious politics and uh, this is the culmination of several identities and ideologies that have been taking place for the past 30 years in the region and i i m- i must mention that it is uh, because of the university space that people could could gather all this information the intellectual could work on on these issues and bring that knowledge to the public domain this is the best example that how a university should function that intellectual did not turn their back to what it was happening and they are still doing at their level but again again you know there's so much repression by the state right now that they cannot even talk about like when i was in fact when i was studying there were there were i wanted to study classrooms also but uh, uh, they they said actually we they were they were given instruction that you don't have to use this word telangana you don't have to talk about telangana in class so that's why there were so many seminars every day there were seminars so these were i think very important so seminars again happening in the university space so how people use activists use that university space which has a power and this power can uh, has a different shades and i think activists and intellectuals used those every shade so uh, recently i shared this so this this person you see he's a he's, he's a big activist from 1968 mark rudd who led the 1968 columbia revolt he was the leader of uh, of the so we actually shared these two movements uh, struggle together thank you sorry <laughs> okay that was just pretty uh, enlightening i think man you have uh, i mean that's what i when i reading the book also i experienced i mean i was pretty pretty deeply involved and mm-hmm. but hmm what is hmm. that mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. so anyway i i learned a lot of things that i didn't know and uh, so this this is this is pretty informative and Thank you. Uh, Thank so you. just just a couple of quick questions and then i will i will ask everybody hmm? to open up yeah you can uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah sure 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 uh, yeah. project is not there. no hmm. see uh, you know the the telangana movement the, mm. the students role mm. is the paramount important mm. i think finally that is what uh, mm. even though the whole civic society participated mm. right mm. but the, the militancy and the the the, the times at which you know they responded right mm-hmm. for example when ksr was hunger strike and he almost gave up right i mean the way the students responded the, the militancy and the urgency uh-huh. it forced him to go back mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. so those are some of the things uh, i mean the, the student leadership actually mm-hmm. was was very fantastic okay mm-hmm. i mean i i know most of the leaders in 2009 jo- joint action committee people mm-hmm. i knew them for a long time i was mentoring them and all mm-hmm. that i was very happy to see the kind of leadership emerge so just just in that context one question you know mm. have you seen any um, parallels similar to telangana <coughs> movement in india mm. like for example asu mm. movement like mm. when i was like assam mm. student union right mm. asu assam student Shurun union <coughs> in 80s they formed uh, basically they were able to form a government mm-hmm. in assam mm-hmm. i think there were like uh, i don't know like uh, 50% of them were bachelors in their assembly mm-hmm. and the chief minister was 35 years old i was in the college okay so it was a fantastic achievement mm-hmm. unfortunately telangana students could not succeed in that even though they had such a formidable uh, role in, mm-hmm. in you know forming the telangana state they politically they could not succeed mm-hmm. so do you think what went wrong between them and here uh, do you see any parallel actually thanks for reminding this uh, this is an 
Uh, this this course I know that actually this should be explained when we talk about movement. This 1969 generation, when I interviewed them, they said because we failed in 671 after elections and our you know people sold themselves. He said we did that mistake because our people were cheated. You know we we were betrayed. He said in 70s, Asu people came to us before they launched any movement. They said wow. they came to us. We guided them, wow. and they, they succeeded. succeeded. In the way. See, we we told them, don't depend on politician. You become the politician, and they all become. But unfortunately, they all became corrupt. <laughs> you know, they all spoiled. They couldn't form their own party, right? There was a strong that whole joint oh. action committee mm -hmm. could have become mm -hmm. a party. Right? Yeah, and then mm -hmm. challenge in case we are. Yeah. It didn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think this one, is one thing mm -hmm. I saw was I mean. Uh, the big difference between ASU time and you know 2000s is uh, 10 and 40. I mean, like we're talking about uh, 40, right? <laughs> um, the, at that time, the money power in elections was minimal. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is before pre-liberalization era versus oh, post-liberalization. Okay. Nowadays, I mean, the kind of money, I mean, all the student leaders have to maintain cost, right? Mm -hmm. You didn't need that at that time. Mm -hmm. You know. For going on bicycles, cycles, mm -hmm. and you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a different era. Mm -hmm. So that was a, one of the biggest difference I noticed. It uh -huh. Because we were people, we were like trying yeah. very, very, very hard mm -hmm. to see if the students could launch a party. Mm -hmm. But we were not successful. That's yeah. one of the biggest things I could see the yeah. difference between that time and this time. Exactly. Okay? Yeah. yeah. No, I think money played a big role. Yeah, at in this fact, time, at yeah, this time yeah, in election, exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to run any politics is a you know you need money to run politics, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. there's no legal way to do in India right now. Exactly. So it's a uh, mm -hmm. so the 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 money big money is needed mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to run the politics. No. Yeah. So another question, you know, Usmania, you, you know that right? This is. 90% uh, of the student population now is SC, ST, BC mm -hmm. on the campus, right? Mm -hmm. And then um, they're, most of them are first generation educated mm -hmm. and demonstrated really, really formidable leadership qualities, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Today, the, the most of the students, even though we got the state, are very disappointed with TRS mm -hmm. government, mm -hmm. probably mm -hmm. to the extent that no CM and ministers could dare to go to university now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. There was actually a last year. There was a hundred years of celebration. Yeah. And um, they invited the president, and they said they negotiated with the students. CM has to come. Their uh, missionary or like official missionary, and said, "Okay, we want CM to come. You guys should not disturb." They said they can come, but he should not utter a word. He just come on the stage and go. Then we won't say anything. Mm -hmm. If he speaks, we are going to be violent. So mm -hmm. he came to. The hundred years of celebration, he just stood on the podium, the president spoke, and then he left. Wow. Mm. So that is the kind of situation, you know. So, mm. you know, what do you think, you know, what went wrong and what students should have done differently to basically make sure their aspirations are met in this new Telangana? There's a deep disappointment right now, especially if you go to Usmania University. Mm. Yeah. No, when uh, right after uh, the formation, when I went, of course, government was yeah. formed. So people, I could see immediately that people were not happy. Yeah. First of all, the leadership is given to wrong hands. Even even within student politics, those who were uh, co-opted some of the leaders, co-opted yeah. some, yeah, and uh, uh, issues like you know. Nilu, Nidlu, Niam, Kalu. Right. These, these were the issues. They are still pending, like the issues of water, employment. These issues are still not addressed. You know, I was looking at all these advertisements. I mean, since in last five, seven years, there was not even a single ad ad advertisement for the, the major post, like where they can accommodate students. All the, all the appointments are policemen, yeah. you know, or the fourth yeah. class jobs, right. where and this was a sad story while I was studying. PhD students, you know, doctoral students were applying for peon jobs in those days. And uh, there's no education. There's hardly people don't know even what are they studying. So imagine what will they do? So this, I think, education, uh, and this is unfortunate that uh, 
people uh, scholars told me that until 1975 this was such a prestigious university yeah. that people from the us would like to go and teach there but then all of a sudden this because of this whole uh, change from next slide movement and all it all just kind of spoiled this whole academic rigor and uh, turned to be and then of course neoliberalism played a very negative role in terms of now we have we have uh, uh, so many hundreds of universities private universities which actually spoiled this whole uh, thing now it's all ranking business you know everyone is doing this uh, um, private colleges people are opening and they uh, kind of the way they are uh, educating people is just what is not it's not leading them to anywhere because the thing is uh, we are not producing any planners we are not producing any thinkers universities are even some people some scholars say that universities are 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 meant to be nowadays the space to prepare for upsc you know the competitive exams it becomes a shelter for for youth and you know for their bread and butter and that's the image now of the government universities it can easily be changed why because we have we have best example of jnu hcu you know uh, iits these are all government but it the government is somehow not paying attention to that and new especially hyderabad out of all the uh, cities in india hyderabad the has the highest number of uh, of private institutions and this is the recent study says and uh, plus coaching centers do you know last year when the in uh, one coaching center in hyderabad in one day result came of engineering entrance 26 students committed suicide in one day so this shows that which direction actually our education is going and people don't even pay attention to that imagine just for the entrance not any i mean you are not even trying few times and then losing hope so this is this is the state of mind and uh, uh, there is no future of social sciences because there is no funding people uh, in arts college they are doing all these self finance courses uh so no. yeah it's this kind of it's sad state of sad, sad yeah mm -hmm. anyway so let's let's open up yeah. the you know mm -hmm. question mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah first of all amazing talk that's that is wonderful that is great i have two big questions mm -hmm. uh for gora and then i have one which probably you both can mm -hmm. uh answer so um the first one i was at, I'm, so i'm i'm really struck by like how the suicide rates are so high among students and um in the beginning you showed that uh, the highest numbers of suicide are in maharashtra mm -hmm. so i was wondering if that is that has something to do with how um, there is a dissonance Mm -hmm. uh in students especially in students uh that they about their identity being able to claim that identity mm -hmm. and then getting that push back mm -hmm. in the universities mm -hmm. because we know even now our academic <coughs> spaces mm -hmm. are um you know captured by mm -hmm. brahminical forces mm -hmm. so they still have that mm -hmm. um you know um, power mm -hmm. over the universities mm -hmm. and so students who um individuals or students who come from marginalized communities mm. when they enter those spaces mm -hmm. um they have this dissonance between their identities mm -hmm. so do you think that has something to to play uh, a role in suicides um and also just adding to that i think suicides um as much as i understand because i've done a couple of trainings in like suicide prevention on campuses and so as i understand suicides are seen as the like the hopelessness mm. aspect like that is the major um idea that nothing will change and that's why people commit suicides and so when you say that um the students thought that um that my suicide uh is associated with the hope that a new state will be created mm. um i kind of don't really relate those things together mm. so i don't know if you want to speak a little bit about that um and then the other one is about um you mentioned that 
are moving from um, ideology to identity. Mm. So I, I, I'm not sure about that because mm. I feel like ideology is behind all kinds of identity. Mm. So if we think about this movement, um, when, when the movement was Marxist, mm. Mm. so that was Marxist identity Mm. Uh, ideology, mm. which was followed by the people in the community, mm. and then it moved towards Ambedkarite ideology. Mm. So definitely, there is a regional identity, mm. but it's also like powered by ideology at the back. Mm. So uh, you know, looking at those things together, either they are like you know sides of the same coin, mm -hmm. or like how do you look at it? Um, mm. And the third one is for sorry, this is very long. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And the third one is, uh, Venkata, I was really struck by how you, uh, how when Gaurav talked about um, uh, the state of Osmania University getting the academics going down because privatization, neoliberalization, and also like Naxalite movements. But when you, then you mentioned about how 90% of the population in the university is SC, ST, and OBC. So I wonder if it has something to do with marginalized communities getting their access into the university and then subsequently the level or the academic rigor mm. going down. So I wonder mm. if it has something to do with that. So mm. just go about that. Yeah. Can I answer that quickly? Yeah, yeah, sure, Actually, sure. No, it is nothing to do with SCST OBCs. Mm. Reducing the standard. No, no, see, no, 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 it's no, seen as like no, 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 no. It's not. The... See, the the couple of things are happening. One is like uh, you mentioned, the Telugu states have taken this private engineering college education to the extreme. Mm -hmm. There were in a combined state, there were seven hundred plus engineering colleges, mm -hmm. then another two hundred pharmacy colleges, another three hundred, uh, you know. Uh, what do you call those MCA, my master of computer applications and all that. And most of these colleges, the the number of students coming out out of 12th grade, you don't have enough people coming out qualified past 12th grade to fill those seats. Mm. That's how bad it became. Mm. So what happened is given this, whoever could want to get could get into these engineering schools. So who left, I mean, the, the lot who left after people going into engineering would go to sciences, typical, okay, social science. So the whole quality of students, okay, that are going into social sciences has become very, very, very low quality. There's nothing to do with, and obviously, given, you know, Telangana, especially Telangana, 93% population of Telangana is ST, ST, OBC minority. We have just seven percent is so-called, you know, uh, general category. You see that? So, given that much population, obviously, those who are coming to campuses, okay, the college education, constituted because even anybody has little uh, access, little money, they would go to an engineering college, and those who couldn't afford, who couldn't, you know. Uh, then they are going into college. And then that's one reason. The other reason is these universities, uh, especially last 15, 20 years, the governments are like not giving funds. Especially this, the, the KCR government is brutal. There are 1,200 posts in Usmania University officially. Okay, these are sanctioned, I mean, 1,200, like probably 20 years back, okay? Then what is happening is there are recruitment, you know, like twice, I think, since in the last two, 20 years, they recruited 200 once, 150 once. And the last recruitment happened about eight years back, eight, nine years back. So the, the professors are retiring, but there's no recruitment. So today, the last, uh, I mean, statistic I heard is out of 1,200, there are less than 600 full-time faculty. So what kind of, uh, you know, so they're just hiring all these contract lecturers to teach, come and teach one course, two courses. And there's so many departments don't even have a full professor to do research. There's no provision for PhD students. See, the Usmania University, as early as 2009, okay, 
I know because I, I was very involved with actually this art college. There were more than thousand social science research scholars in that building that you saw. Mm -hmm. Thousand. So it was it was you know there were like twenty six departments in that building. There were like French studies, Urdu studies, uh, Sanskrit studies. To you know you you wouldn't find some of these like not normal. Mm -hmm. About twenty six departments, but completely destroyed mm -hmm. in the last 15 20 years and this present government is very brutal mm -hmm. the the universities they are the six seven uh, regular you know uh, non specialized universities um, all of them didn't have vice chancellor for two years two years to wow. just the high court somebody had to go to high court and the high court warned the government you should recruit then they recruit that's a it's a deliberate negligence mm -hmm. of present government so it's it's unfortunately it was one of the top universities oldest universities and the last 15 20 years it was really going down and when it was established the nizam who was a muslim ruler imagine the, his vision that he was the only one in in india Look. who translated the entire science into Urdu. He, he called the scholars from Iran, from other right. parts, and he said, hired them and translate. He wanted to teach everyone local in a local language. That was his focus. Mm -hmm. you know? And even Rabindranath Tagore praised, right. he said, this is, the, uh, this is the model one India should follow if you talk about this, you know, uh, India as a diverse and all. So um, he praised it. So, um, uh, so we answered is, the last question. Yeah. <laughs> no, think. yeah, the last two one we were saying, yeah. So well. about this, uh, this whole uh, SCST OBC. In fact, just where you go anywhere in India, in any village, government schools. Nowadays, for past 20 years, government schools are meant for only SCST and OBC. Yeah. So you say 20 years. Who are then going to um, college? These are the people. So, and they all go for social sciences. Those people who are going for engineering and medical sciences, they always go uh, for the, you know, they, because they're all upper caste. There you will find actually 85, 90% upper caste. There you have SCST OBC are marginalized. So uh, even Professor Gopal Guru also said, he said the social science is now because there is no funding. That's why, uh, so they allow, um, and this is the case here also in the US. You tell me any uh, the least scholars in, in the social sciences. When social sciences was a what Gopal Guru called the honey bee, you know, then all the upper caste came and sucked that honey. And now there's no honey left. It's now we are entering. You know, so that's the, the state of mind. So this is that's why all the uh, social sciences, even in small colleges I see in, in small small cities it is only uh, the SST OBCs are there so uh, then important very important question of oh like before I go to ideology let me talk about the suicide also now uh, I worked on a on a one-year project with the University College London on mental health with a psychiatrist which is a he's the first Delhi psychiatrist I think we should invite him sometime Dr. Shushru Jalam and uh, yeah 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 and he, uh, so we, we explored that why, especially after Rohit Vemula, that why Delhi students are committing suicide. So I was doing ethnography at JNU. And see, now I am not a psychologist or social or, or, psych, or, 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 or a psychiatrist. But as a layman, I used to think that people who go in depression or, you know, face a lot of stress or commit suicide are generally the introvert people. But then suicide of Rohit Vemula has changed that perception also. So this is a sad state of affair that activists now are committing suicide. And then uh, I think when we are in this stream, then you understand, like psychologists understand better that how one suicide influences many others. And I was closely observing that. There was a guy called Muthu Krishna from JNU. He was in HCU. He was friend of Rohit. But that same time he moved to JNU. Now it's not in being being your first. He was in MPhil first year. He did not even complete the first year. But in the same month when Rohit Vemula in, committed in January in February, 
he committed suicide the same month in jnu after a year so psycho psychologists or psychiatrists they can easily make out that link but uh, we don't have any methodology to study caste based suicide that is one of the, yeah. the limitation all these durkheimian uh, what you know four types of suicide that doesn't work because our structure is different and then you now coming to the the ideology question i think uh, ideology has never it's ne it's not a monolithic whole it can never ever stay in its pure form let me give you the best example from telangana movement you would also tell better telangana movement has a kind of is known for its marxist ideology communist ideology or say maoist ideology whatever you call it so left ideology and has been very powerful ever even actually at whatever whatever is left over is still there i mean you can say that this is more once upon a time in 19 in 70s 1970s there were 72 groups among communists working in the so i happened to meet some of those groups when i was working i asked uh, many of them i said uh, sir why did you form a separate group and he said uh, oh you know son there were some ideological issues. Mm. I said, okay. Then I asked the other one, I said, why did you got separated from the main group? He said, there were some ideological issues. I said, how many issues can it be that you have to form 72 groups? And same case with Vamsef, any Dalit movement. When people bring this new concept of, of Mool Nivasi and all thousands of, do you think that that's what Ambedkar said? Do you think Marx said that you have to have this? Actually, uh, I would recommend, you should read this philosopher which I'm reading these days called Stuart Hall, a British thinker. He has an answer for this. He said, this ideologies and all these things actually is just a, it's just there on a paper. You, it's an ideal type, you know, it's like, you know, being moral. You have to follow this, other, but it never exists in reality. It can never exist. He said that is why when people reach to the top level, leadership level, when they reach to that level, then there's no ideology. For them, anybody who is close to them is the other, means the enemy. And that is why communist movement is the best example. Those who say that we are, we are following an ideology, they are known for their ideology. Nowhere it got success know where it got success because there is always that that mindset works that it is always about the ego about the identity it's individual's identity and that individual's identity, individual's identity. that's what Stuart Hall said he said individual's ego and we never ever focus that on that we never even study that you know it's finally the individual's ego like, do you think even uh, what Modi is doing is following an ideology he is satisfying his ego. Amit Shah would reach to his level. He will also do the same he's thing. Ah, he's a puppet. Of, yeah. No, he, <laughs> they say. But actually, there are always then why if, if someone represents someone ideology, why there are internal clash? Always. This is, this is the fate. When you get into power, then everything just collapse, start collapsing. And then you will see the fate. If they already started losing their base, you see in Haryana, they were just struggling to win. They didn't get the majority. They had to... You know, so, and you will see the fate. So we just say that, oh, no, no, this ideology is ruling, but it doesn't work. You know, after five years, Congress will come back again. So that's how it works. So there is no ideology as such. If it is, if it was, it would remain in paper. And Telangana movement, I think, if one study can give the best answer. And what is important is that how these new networks are being, being formed. That is the, the, the focus of these current studies, that how we form this network in these, this, this global world, in this world which is full of uh, what you call the virtual world. That is being the challenge now. Because now, at least in ideological sense, you had face-to-face -face interaction where you, have, you can form a community. But now, uh, that is another challenge. And that is leading to another kind of chaos leading more kind of mental health and suicide issues you know london is facing a severe issues that uh, the highest number of suicide and uh, many other society including japan is having these uh, issues of stress because people are not even having relationship 
you know i i was in japan last year and i saw uh, in a, i was in a small city and i was surprised that in one week i stayed in venkatji i did not see a any small kid so uh, people yeah, don't marry yeah, yeah. so uh, where would that society lead to where, what what will be the future and young people those who shift to tokyo they don't make any relationship they are now society is obsessed with these cartoon characters they mm-hmm. fall in love with cartoon characters and spend their life. so i mean this is what actually this these are the challenges which a youth is facing and then you can imagine the state of universities we can we even think about any movement now what what these people in 69 they have done you know uh, columbia revolt berkeley revolt and this so, uh, so these are the challenge i guess hmm. yeah so hmm. hmm. very fascinating and very good question uh, although i didn't know much about uh, hmm. struggle earlier rather than The first one is you mentioned that you wanted to study because the, the, the movement is ongoing. Oh. I think in the you can look at it and see that many people have been like this. And that is also what we want. So, the question is what interested people in the development of that movement. And second, There were four states on mm. right that are that are mm-hmm. yeah. um, mm. three. Three states. Mm-hmm. So what why why do you think that the, it was so much of a struggle for Tal Telangana mm. while those three states were formed in comparatively much? Very, very, very nice actually, very nice question because it is the formation of these states, uh three states. which led which actually revived the demand of telangana they said yeah we are struggling for 50 years and these guys haven't done anything there was no blood shed for uttarakhand and it's uttarakhand was formed jharkhand was formed and chatisgarh they said nobody actually did something we are, so that's how tr has started you know for it was formed that idea and then they carried forward so this was an important uh, so what, you know, what was the difference like why it was so much harder for telangana hmm. but it was compared to because the thing is again because telangana people were marginalized for 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 centuries first by the nizam they were not given uh, any were see acha one thing i forgot to ask the base why actually this region is important because this is the only region uh, sanjay ji in india which was never been ruled by britishers mm-hmm. so it remained a complete non english uh, it was not never been exposed to english language so it was only telugu so when it no no it was actually mixed um, obc is a very large population muslims were also kafi but when it was merged then the problem started because then the whole composition changed when andhra people i i have in my book this whole number of every year is like you know what people come here to the us there every year number kept increasing to uh, migration to andhra uh, to hyderabad and the settlers so these settlers we can they started making their own colony they never allowed any telangana to be part of them and this is what that's why i use this term internal colonization and uh, uh, so when a section is remained historically backward i think they get on even if you, you go now anywhere in india you will hardly find any faculty from telangana uh, and but you will see rep- representation of andhra people everywhere so uh, they didn't get their voice they got their voice only in you can say 90s onwards and then uh, new intellectuals came up but in chatisgarh and all government had their own interest you know the government was never interested in telangana because uh, there was hardly anybody representing uh, the, his voice to telangana it was all uh, kind of manipulating going through it was uh, ha- i i'm just forgetting one name i a guy from telangana 1952 he got a job a small job in a office and uh, almost almost yeah and he was yeah first uh, first uh, government job holder in telangana 1952 he said that although i was a kind of officer in telangana uh, but 
uh, my all my staff was the andhra people he said to talk to my own subordinate other officer i had to go through andhra clerk tell him that he are saab se baat so this was the repression that you know andhra people were thinking like a secretary at yeah. 5 5000 employees mm. there was less than 500 telangana even though like mm. there are 40% population mm. less than 500 less than you know 10% and then within i, I, uh, I, I want to answer this question yeah, yeah, sure, sure, it's sure. a very important mm. question mm. actually mm. i want to which answer he was asking why it became easy mm-hmm. and why it is no no, no please, so please. so it's a, it's a fundamentally different mm-hmm. you know the situation telangana was in was mm-hmm. that's why it, it is a amazing victory mm-hmm. then we won through the see all those uh, three states when they formed they are actually backward regions mm-hmm. and the developed region has no interest in that in that part of the region so they were happy to let it go <coughs> okay mm-hmm. because the it wouldn't impact the the better part of the state mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. and uh, whereas telangana i mean they were this is all history right mm-hmm. 1947 which uh, which district are you from in maharashtra but amravati amravati was not see hyderabad. you had of uh, hyderabad maharashtra mm. right maratwada yeah. so it was actually until 1946 56 until 1956 47 so called india got independence but the 48 september 17 until then hyderabad was an independent country mm. independent country yeah. it was india pakistan hyderabad mm-hmm. okay we were a separate country <laughs> Mm-hmm. yeah then it, that hyderabad consisted of i mean it was one of the it was the largest princely state mm-hmm. in the british india it was the richest princely state it was the most powerful princely state mm-hmm. okay so the hyderabad nizam thought he wanted to be independent okay so then he made a deal with indian union mm-hmm. so indian union signed st- to maintain the status quo mm-hmm. so they let it hyderabad sit as a separate country until of course we had uh, there was a big revolt you you saw the the lady who killed a big landlord so mm-hmm. there was this is a little bit of a mix a lot of things were going on in our part of the world um there was a very bad feudal system mm-hmm. okay so the the neat low i mean the the people they call peasants revolted and basically they against this landlord and they started killing them okay and that became actually when the entire eastern europe was going through this communist movement we're talking about 44 time frame then they came later and organized it in under and that is first communist movement in india okay and it was basically armed struggle like a 5000 people of our ancestors died like women and men were fighting with <coughs> guns and that's actually our freedom struggle we never knew satyagraha we never knew quit india we never knew any gandhi's things in our part of the world we were literally fighting with guns mm-hmm. uh, against nizam so there was a lot of things going on right one is this 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 war is going on the other thing is the there was a pressure for nizam to basically join indian union mm-hmm. because you know there is a muslim king but uh, majority were hindus like 85% is hindus mm. and 15% were muslims mm. and obviously majority wanted to join indian union okay mm. then but i mean he was so powerful he managed to make a deal with indian union to maintain status quo mm-hmm. okay and so india didn't touch uh, hyderabad until september 1948 for 13 months after Can india got independent so what happened is this whole revolt became really brutal right? the communists actually liberated 5000 villages established village governments and this land was owned by you know one big landlord everybody was a worker in that village they <laughs> took away land distributed and you know it ran like 2 to 3 years uh, this communist basically but it was it was a civil <laughs> war was going on and then it came to a point one actually near my my town where i grew up was like a epicenter of all the movement um one village 
one day the nizam military came and killed 70 people in village mm -hmm. it's considered second jallianwala bag but hardly mm -hmm. anybody knows about yeah. it yeah there is a lot of history which exactly. actually not but digged up we people like so the much generation history. that we grew up were never taught by this andhra people mm -hmm. so i mean the reason i'm saying history is basically from that onwards then indian government basically sensitized and they came, military came and took over Hyderabad. I mean, it was hmm. 1948, September 17th. That's when Hyderabad, you can call annex, joined, you know, we used hmm. a lot of uh, this thing, you know, occupied if you ask communists and Muslims, hmm. you know. So, but anyway, it joined Indian Union. And then hmm. there was a military government was appointed. And then when the first uh, general elections happened in 1952, uh, the you know the assembly elections. It was Hyderabad state. Hyderabad state had this Telangana, five districts of Maharashtra, three districts of Karnataka. Mm -hmm. Together, it's Hyderabad state. Mm -hmm. Then Andhra, on the other hand, was part of Tamil Nadu until 1947. It was Madras state. Yeah. Then later, they fought. Andhra's fought mm -hmm. again in Tamil, saying that they have been discriminated. They had a violent uh, agitation to get their own state. So the Andhra state was formed in 1952. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, they, they fought discrimination. Mm -hmm. And then it was a state. Then what happened is, 19, um, this first assembly elections happened. Hyderabad state was there, Andhra state was there, and uh, of course, Tamil Nadu. You know. Then what happened, the question of, how do we organize the state? Because what happened? There were 500 princely states, and there were all these provinces under British. So the Indian government had a genuine problem. How do we form and organize these states, right? So then they formed this first state reorganization commission under Faisal Ali. And he recommended, of course, linguistic states. And when it came to a Telangana question, they said Hyderabad. You basically give Maharashtra to, uh, hmm. I mean, five Marathi speaking to Maharashtra, three Kannada, Karnataka speaking to Karnataka, but keep Telangana as separate state. Hmm. Because he used this word, Telangana people are, you know, educationally backward. The reason was when we got independence, Telangana had 11% literacy rate. Because under Nizam, I mean, it was the richest. <laughs> guy in the world actually 1935 time magazine you go he's yeah he was yeah he was the richest man he was on the time magazine mm -hmm. you know he used to send you know gulf countries didn't have money until 70s so from nizam of hyderabad used to send ship load of truck you know the the goods to ramadan time mm -hmm. to middle east mm -hmm. you know washington dc is the first mass yeah. The first biggest donor is Nizam of yeah, Hyderabad. Right. So that was his legacy, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, but he was socially like he built this university like a fort. I mm -hmm. mean, you go there, it's a, it's amazing feeling. Okay, mm -hmm. even like smaller building, engineering college. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is not that magnificent, but even it's like a small fort. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he so had a vision he for did it. He these things. I mean, he had a multi-specialty mm -hmm. aspect. Mm -hmm. Hyderabad was well developed, mm -hmm. but not in like education. You know. Mm -hmm. So what happened is. The reason I'm saying is Hyderabad was a well-developed city, mm -hmm. okay, uh, by, it's a 400-year-old city. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let <Yeah>. me finish. <laughs> uh, and Andhras, on the other hand, came out of Madras. They didn't have a capital city. And then the two rivers flowing through Telangana to Andhra. So they come from Telangana to Andhra, Krishna and Godavari. So they were at the receiving end of it. Mm -hmm. So these two reasons, the Andhras wanted to join Telangana. And from the day one, they started after the, because they, they are the, they, the secretary was under tents, hmm. okay, in Karnul. So they were after Telangana and right from the day one, they started saying, we want to merge, we want to merge. Mm -hmm. they, they passed a resolution in their assembly and all that, whereas Telangana people, because they were educated, they were also economically a little bit advanced. They didn't want to merge. So that was the reason there was a big disparity. But in spite of that, they forced the merger. Mm -hmm. Now, as soon as the merger happened, it was taken over. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, I think he, 
we talked about so much disparity was there. Mm. So the reason is they had an entrenched interest in Hyderabad and Telangana. That's why they don't want to leave. Mm -hmm. So that was the difficult. <laughs> and Betty, Betty, any any question? I just learned so much. I don't think I can ask it. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Like uh, you are not from Telangana, mm -hmm. but as a researcher, like being means I'm I'm also going to face this challenge uh -huh. in future because I'm not going to be that one who will be matching any inter intersection of that as a researcher. Mm -hmm. So you went and did ethnography. Mm -hmm. You were an outsider. So what are your challenges and how you work and like how you build because language as you said you don't know Telugu I don't mm. know how you know mm. but like when you went and mm. one of these inspiration you wanted to mm. go ahead and uh, like see mm. a live moment that is like very fortunate for mm -hmm. you. but then how you like did it like that is my like, yeah and like, how you mm. no I'll, you also asked uh, some of that same question in a way why you choose basically I uh, you know I studied in JNU so I was fascinated by the student politics. So I did my MPhil on student politics. So I then uh, developed that, you know, I understood student politics. Then I was looking for a bigger movement, but student movement. I was, my area was student politics. And then I couldn't find anything but Telangana, which was the largest student politics. But, uh, and that's why I went. I learned the language initially, but the Hyderabadi student, basically they speak in Dakhani Hindi. So I was trying to learn Telugu. They were always responding me to him in Hindi. So they spoiled my Hindi and English both. When I went back home, they said, where is your English? <laughs> so, but, but it was, but as an ethnographer, there are two challenges as an ethnographer that you are outsider studying the, uh, the area which you are not familiar. Another is your students, your students studying the students. That's also a challenge. Sometimes that also plays a role. But it has its own advantage and disadvantage. Because when you are an outsider, people feel free to tell you. Like, you know, for example, when, when US scholar, they go to India, our people are ready to share many things which they don't share with us. You know, so there is, there is always these advantage and disadvantage. So I think I enjoyed both. Many of them, the language has been a challenge. But there are always some challenges. Like in one point I was thinking, I should just take a break, learn full length. But then somebody said, you know, there are always people, those who know language, they have a different challenge. So just go, it's just a you know, part of the game. Just go ahead. So then I finished. <laughs> okay, I think. <laughs> so um, thank you very much, Jaurav. Thank you. No, I want to. Be. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, go ahead, please. Um, yeah, yeah, please, please. Okay. So you're also so, a shyri, right? Yeah. yeah. So actually, uh, uh, yeah. this is a, a poem which I wanted to recite because recently wrote. This is an important issue which actually uh, I uh, we also need to work on this. That you know when we talk about Dalit movement in India, in in US or even in India, we only see these few categories in in. In, in North India, it is generally Chamar community, in, in Maharashtra, it's Mahar community. Where are other communities which never come into scene? And now uh, major, the people who actually really suffer in the caste system, who, whom we never talk about. Recent uh, re report says that in past four years, five years, 300 uh, people died while working in the manhole, sewerage system. So that is such a kind of shame on that. So I, this is the, the poem which I want to dedicate to them. Is it, that the title is called, uh, but this is in Hindi. So just for two minutes, so I'll, I'll finish it. So uh, title is Black Hole. Uh, black Hole, ek aisi jaga, jahan gurutva karshan itna khofnaak ke vishal kaay grahon aur sitaron ko bhi nigal jaye. Yahan tak ki प्रकाश भी एक बार इसकी चपेट में आए तो बाहर का रास्ता खोजते खोजते जाया हो जाए हर सुबह हजारों लोग कांधे पर रस्सी लटकाए और हाथ में एक डंडी लिए निकल पड़ते हैं अंतरिक्ष यात्री की तरह उतर जाते हैं इस ब्लैक होल से भी ज्यादा खतरनाक उस मैन होल में और बाहर निकलते हैं या तो एक खबर बनकर या रिपोर्ट बनकर कि मैन होल में सफाई करते हुए हर साल 300 से ज्यादा लोग दम तोड़ देते हैं 
सदियों से जाति के इस गुरुत्वाकर्षण ने ज्ञान रूपी प्रकाश की गति इतनी धीमी कर दी है कि हम अपने ही घर और मोहल्ले के नीचे का समाज शास्त्र और खगोल शास्त्र नहीं पढ़ पा रहे हैं। रिलेटिविटी के सिद्धांत से ब्रह्मांड तो समझ लिया पर जमीन के नीचे का ब्लैक होल भूल गए जमीनी ही हकीकत के बीचों बीच खड़े ये लोग ना तो तुम्हें दिखाई देते हैं ये ना तुम्हारी कल्पनाओं में आते हैं ना तुम्हारे समझ में आते हैं तुम्हें मूर्तियों में भगवान नजर आता है लेकिन सदियों से तुम्हारे लिए काम कर रहे ये जिंदा लोग नजर नहीं आते वैश्वीकरण के इस दौड़ में शहरों की ओर भागते लोग कस्बे और गांव शहर के सारे जल मार्ग मल मार्ग मवाद अवसाद और गंदगी वाले गैसीले जहरीले और सियाह काले हो चुके पानी में गंदे कीड़े मकोड़ों और जानवरों के बीच गर्दन तक डूबा शरीर बदबू इतनी कि एक सांस में दिमाग ब्लैक आउट हो जाए सोचो अगर तुम्हें नंगे पैर नंगे बदन सिर्फ अपने जनेऊ के साथ इस ब्लैक होल में उतरना पड़े तो सारी पवित्रता सारी पंडिताई और सारी जमींदारी और सारी देशभक्ति पानी पानी हो जाए ब्लैक होल में अपना भविष्य खुरच रहे एक चाचा से मैंने पूछा कि चाचा सुने हो दुनिया चंद्रयान से चांद पर जा चुकी है और तुम अभी अभी तक यहां चाचा बोले बेटा इस नरक में रहते रहते अब तो जीवन एक अमावस सा लगता है मैं यहां से ऊपर देखता हूं तो चांद मैन होल सा लगता है मैन होल के भीतर से आसमान की ओर देखते ये लोग बरसों से इंतजार कर रहे हैं कि कोई मसीहा आएगा और खींच निकालेगा इन्हें इस नरक से बाहर गुजरात से गांधी आए भंगियों की बस्तियों में जाकर व्रत रखा और सीधे साधे लोगों को हरिजन बनाकर चले गए इंदिरा आई इंग्लिश में इसी को पीपल ऑफ गॉड कहा और अपने अपने स्वर्ग सिधार गई अब दामोदर आए हैं कहते हैं स्वच्छता में ही भगवान बसते हैं गरीबों को संस्कारों का भाषण पेल रहे हैं और गंगा जल से पैर धो धोकर इन्हें इस ब्लैक होल इस गैस चैम्बर में धकेल रहे हैं कितनों पर गंगा जल छिड़केंगे दामोदर तुम्हारे रास विकास के रास्ते में बहुत से मैन होल है किस किस से किस किस से बचेंगे दामोदर जिस दिन इस ब्लैक होल में फंसे आदमी को समझ में आ गई तुम्हारी राजनीति उस दिन एक ऐसा जलजला आएगा और बहा ले जाएगा तुम्हारा कागजी विकास तुम्हारी गंगा तुम्हारी जाति गोत्र तिलक जनेऊ मंत्र वंत्र योगा वोगा सब और स्वाह कर देगा तुम्हारा सारा शिक्षा तंत्र सारे इंजीनियर प्लानर्स और सारे विकास पुरुष जो आज तक 21वीं सदी में भी इस मैन होल को मशीन होल में नहीं बदल पाए